poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Well, hello there, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson, and today's guest on CPG is a high-performance coach for folks ranging from business execs to professional athletes to, most importantly of all, poker players, the performance coach of Raise Your Edge, Coach Bauman. This is Coach's second of what I imagine to be many future stops on the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. So if you missed round one, you may want to hop back into the Wayback Machine and listen to our first conversation so that you can gobble up all of Coach Bauman's greatness bombs. In today's show with Coach Bauman, we're going to dive deep into some of his coaching techniques, including provocation, get his thoughts on Phil Helmuth threatening to light his own hair on fire if he doesn't win, and much, much more. But before you dive into today's show, I just wanted to remind you that on December 1st, 2021, my private coaching rates are going to go up. And then on January 1st, 2022, I'm going to put a freeze on purchasing any private coaching sessions with me until at least April 1st, 2022. I'll honor any sessions purchased before January 1st, but my immediate goal is to put as much energy as I possibly can into the CPG Wolves coaching for profits program. And if you are planning on finding a private coach sometime next year, I'll be training and bringing on an associate coach to fill that void, just giving you a heads up. So now without any further ado, I bring to you one of the most beloved and respected mindset and performance coaches in the world of poker, the great coach Bob. Coach Bob and how you doing, sir? I'm great, Brad. Thank you so much. It just um, reminded me of that amazing first talk that we had when we went really deep into some personal stuff. I really enjoyed that. I always love the opportunity to talk a little bit about politics and history and other interesting topics that might not relate to poker, but definitely there's poker players out there who are really curious about certain topics like that. So I was really happy to be able to talk about that. Excited to do round two. Yeah, I mean... The thing is, you know, it's my show <laughs> and we talk about this stuff that I'm interested in, right? Because first and foremost, I think the the major priority for me, because I know how I am, is that like, I've got to love something. And if I do love it, then I'm passionate about it. And when I'm passionate about it, I keep doing it. And when that passion kind of dies out and it becomes like a grind, then I stop doing it. Right. So like for this podcast, um, yeah, I think that's that's my guiding light, right? Like, if I'm passionate about it, let's talk about it. Even if it, like, we can figure out a way to tie it into poker to make it make sense at the end of the day. But Always. first and foremost, let's talk about interesting stuff. And yeah, so what have you been up to? This is the first the first question for the round two conversations. What have you been up to since our, our first go-round? Uh, it's funny because it's um, a very interesting phase now that I'm in uh, in my life and in my company where um, getting on the crossroads of some couple of major decisions, actually. The reason why I got here was just uh, working my balls off uh, legitimately uh, for the last year and a half. Um, I got a whiff of business and I got a whiff of success, something that I described last time that I haven't had in my life ever before. And it was addictive and it was uh, validating and uh, it really forced me down this path of sacrificing everything to get more of that. Um, and it, it has definitely um, done me well, uh, business wise, uh, personally as well. I think I've again, known myself and my friends a lot more than before. Uh, but there's also, of course, other priorities in life that I definitely have been neglecting here and there. So been like what? This- what are we oh, been neglecting? My relationship, for example. Uh, I would say I definitely would uh, think that I have to put me in more effort there. Uh, just simple things like my cat. Um, I really love that guy. Uh, and I just want to spend time with him to have a good relationship and not just be like, 
two strangers living in a house, you know, that see each other from time to time, that actually invest with like playing and buying him stuff. And, you know, and, um, you got to coordinate, those- you got to coordinate with the cats, man. They're, it's not that they, they work on their own schedule. So <laughs> absolutely. And uh, cats are, if you want a relationship with your cat, you're going to have to take the initiative and invest. In it. <laughs> They're not going to reach out to you and say, Hey, I would like to be uh, a cool pet for you, sir. No, <laughs> if you want me to cool pet? You got to make the move, buddy. Yeah. You got to <laughs> earn so, it. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think all of those things like physical health, studying, self-improvement uh, have been on the back burner just because I got a whiff of success in business and it was super addicting and super validating and just went down this path uh, and I snapped out of it uh, with a conversation with a friend a week ago, funny enough, who told me like, um, I'm actually really, he's, he's a shareholder in a company and um, he said, I'm really happy for you. I'm, I'm actually very surprised with the growth and it's good, uh, but you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> like, dude, this, you're not going to be able to keep this up. Let's be real. You know, you got to be able to delegate a little bit more give some tasks out and take care of yourself and do some fun stuff because you're not going to, you're not going to make it. Um, this is a long game. You know, coaching is not an overnight success where you're going to, you know, finish up on an app or platform and you're going to be bought out for a billion dollars. This is going to be a very long relationship building investing game where hopefully after a decade or two, you're going to have a good uh, bunch of relationships to rely on and a solid business that you've built on top of them. So that's something that I had to come to uh, to terms with and accept that, okay, if this is going to be a long game, let's make some sacrifices in the business aspect of it. Accept a more reasonable pace of growth. Yeah, it's, it is addictive and it's also tough and it, it sounds simple to delegate, right? What I, what I find is that the more I delegate, the more I realize that I've just created another job for myself and that's managing people to go on top of all the other things that I do. So sometimes even delegation is very overwhelming because managing human beings, um, that's why people are managers. (laughs) That's why that's their only job is managing these people and coordinating logistically. Uh, So yeah, being a being a coach, being a business owner, being an entrepreneur, um, especially when you're an army of one or a handful, is a lot of work. It, it requires a lot of energy, and the reality is that you only have so many hours in the day. And if you allocate sixty to a hundred hours a week, every week into your business, well, there are things that suffer. You're taking from other relationships, other humans in your life other hobbies, things that you love doing that you just, you can't do. Um, And that's sort of the reality of it. And I think that that's, uh, I guess, until you experience it, you kind of miss that when, you know, dreaming about being your own boss and running your own business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just simple things that I completely abandoned. Uh, I picked back up this week, like reading uh, video games. I picked, finally got in my like, waiting list of steam and that I've been just putting in and in and in games and games on top of games. Like I'll, I'll play in one day, you know, the part I'm never going to play, but still finally I made my first attempt on, you know, uh, finishing up a couple of these like red dead redemption Two. Um, that was an incredible game. I finally had some time to, to get in. And I've noticed that I am just so much more refreshed and happy and excited for work after quote unquote wasting time that in my mind right yeah. um because you feel some sort of urgency again like okay i relaxed now let's get back into it instead of feeling that you know that grind it's just uh, it becomes a grind and 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 that's a shame because in our position as coaches and as as business owners we live lives that a lot of people would would literally die for so i think it's good to be aware of that and and to embrace it as much as possible and and not waste it feeling miserable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just part of, yeah, it's, you have a lot of energy, especially when you start out your own business, you've got a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, and you get a lot of like dopamine hits whenever you make a sale, when you make a new client, when somebody signs up for a consult with when whatever happens and then, you know, the grind, you know, when I think of like the grind as it relates to business is I've got this running checklist of things that I need to do before I go to bed at night, 
I've got like five or 10 items in my head that's like, need to reply to this email, need to reply to this direct message. Did I forget something? Did I forget to reply to an email or a direct message about a course, consult, whatever it is? And then you wake up and then like, you just get after it, you know? And then it, it, you can't take a break because things got to get done. The, the train's got to keep rolling. Um, mm. But yeah, I think hopefully, hopefully, it's a phase of building an immature business. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's the the blood price, the blood sacrifice that has to be made in order to find some measure of success. And then over time, I, it's kind of like life or like poker. You need to learn, you need to grow, you need to evolve. You, you got to learn new skills. You have to understand risk. Risk as it relates to bringing people on, risk as it relates to... Um, delegating your time, your energy, trusting people that they're going to be able to do things just as well as you. And yeah, it's all a learning experience. And that's sort of where I'm at in my, in my career. And I don't think it's a thing that you can just weasel your way out of (laughs) just like overnight. You know, you can't just pull you like, no matter what you try to do, it takes time. Even like when I said, hiring a manager, like being a manager of people, right? When you first onboard somebody and they're taking over your responsibilities, well, you've got to teach them what you do. And that that, that's an extra responsibility in the beginning. So in the beginning, you bring somebody on, everybody's like, oh, that'll make your life so much easier. Well, it will eventually, but the first few months, it's like even more work. You know, it's because you have to teach them all the things that you do while you're doing all the things that you do. Everything, and that's the tricky part of um business that people from the sidelines, but also poker, I think people from the sidelines are um, programmed to um, question, when is it going to pay off? And what is the payoff? Right? Because we're so used in, in, in society to get a consistent and pre decided payoff to the things that we do, whether it's right, if we are going to invest in a diet, we would like to see concrete results and things and predictions, or if we're going to invest in a job, we want to have a salary that's fixed every month or whatever. And in business, it's just everything is an investment, whatever you do, even if you hire a person, initially, it's going to be an investment. Even on top of that, that what you're already investing, right, your time, your effort, you're sacrificing so much. So all every level of scaling is just progressively more investing of your time and effort and you do sometimes get this sense of okay so when does the payoff come <laughs> so when do i hit the big time like but then that moment for me also hits and 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 i realize that like this is really this is really all i ever wanted so i shouldn't complain that much um of course you're not going to hit that you know that one i have some people hitting me up sometimes on instagram and telling me no i'm for sure i'm going to hit that sunday million one time and like yeah that's like very i recognize that in business as well like you want to hit that one big thing that hits that milestone that that kind of tips you over that edge where you but that's that's never going to happen right they keep the goalposts and it's yeah. bigger and <laughs> like you never- said It doesn't, right? If I go back a year in time and look at my podcast metrics today compared to then, look at my business revenue today compared to then, all like I would have been super pumped and been like, sweet, like we are making incredible progress. And yet today I say there's still so much more to do. There's more room to grow. Like you said, we moved those goalposts back. Um, you, You also mentioned something about about risk and investment as it relates to business. And I think it's true in poker too, where, you know, I have clients that will, or potential clients that are like, well, how many coaching sessions will, do you think it'll take? And I'm like, mm. that, I can't give, I can't answer that. It, this depends, like, first of all, it's your journey. So like what you invest in, you get back. And I, I'm not in control of what you invest in. I'm not in control of where you're at. I'm not in control of how, you know, the work that you make, the progress that you make, how we fit as coach and client, because sometimes different personality types, um, they, they just don't resonate as well as others. So some people's progress is very quick and some people's progress is very slow. And as poker players, we get used to this uncertainty because we wake up, we fire up our tables and we know we can 
feel at the top of our game. We can meditate for 20 minutes, hit the gym super hard, get a great night's sleep, fuel ourselves with the highest quality nutrition, and then mm. get the ever living shit kicked out of us at the tables for you know weeks straight. And, and that's just part of the risk of being a poker player. And so I think that like poker players understand that a lot better than most people in that sometimes there's just lots of uncertainty in life and there's no guarantees and you just got to do the best that you can and trust that or have faith that doing the best that you can will eventually work out. Absolutely. I, I, I believe it will over time. But this, this variance thing is interesting, right? Because I always believe that um, variance in poker is definitely one of the, the pretty big factor in the game, right? Variance is a pretty big factor in the game. But at the same time, I think sometimes poker players underestimate how much variance is a factor in everything, right? That they envy, let's say, professional athletes. Like, oh, they just, if they just work hard, they get there and they achieve whatever. But that's just absolutely not true. If you look at the variance in Super Bowl games or look in the variance in uh, uh, soccer World Cups or look in the variance of even uh, competitions and, and long seasons, long competitions of how many things could have gone left or right or 50 50 decisions that change not only teams, but also individual people's careers in which you had absolutely no control of, right? Somebody comes in, breaks your leg, ends your season, and you, you have to recover two years, and now your chance is gone. And you're playing somewhere in the third division in Germany instead of at Liverpool, right? How much impact Varian has in overall life is a pretty scary thing to even accept that that's there, right? So I think it's safe to limit it to the world of poker, um, but when it gets to actual life and the privilege that we have of being healthy and you know free and being able to express our opinions in a podcast, like it's just small things, just to be in those environments is yeah, it's major. It's really major, and and sometimes it takes away from our own achievements. Not right. A lot of things we're just lucky to have. Um, I don't think we have to look at it that way. But the variance in, in, in poker is, you know, we all know it's there and, and it's the only reason why the game works still yeah. that it does. We, we just, we, we, we want to have the illusion of control when yeah. the reality is like <laughs> everything, like pretty much everything in life, um, circumstances around how we grow up, our natural intelligence, our skin color, our height, our weight, our, how, our level of attractiveness, like there's just, there's massive variance just all around. I mean, even as it relates to professional athletes before they become professional athletes, like what, what family were they born into? What resources did that family have? What's their age? Like what month of the year were they born in? Right? Like Malcolm Gladwell in outliers and talking about hockey in Canada, where kids that were older had a, a later birthday, oftentimes had an edge early on over the kids that were younger, because the difference between like a six and a five year old is a really big deal in hockey. And yeah, so, you right, you're, you're six, you do well, which means you get better coaches, you get better performance, you get better training than the other kids. And then that just sort of snowballs over the course of the next 15 years. And then you find yourself, you know, in a position to be a professional hockey player, whatever it is. So anyway, yeah. all right. So basically uh, lots, like of, <laughs> lots of variance in this Absolutely. experience yeah. that we call life. Um, I saw a documentary on YouTube about history and the Iranians, the Persian empire uh, getting beaten by Alexander the Great. And they were trying to figure out how that could happen. And they were saying, okay, so there's a little bit of strategy involved. There's some, you know, uh, some underestimating from the Persians some bad strategy in the warfare, et cetera. But I think a huge factor that historians do not want to acknowledge is variance. Right? Sometimes shit just goes bad and you have no explanation for it and your whole country gets taken over with, with a bad beat. You know, things happen and it's actually insane, but people describing history never take account for variance. They always try to explain things in rational terms, like, oh, it probably was the army or some natural disaster or something. No, just these guys got unlucky and the empire got taken over. You imagine losing your empire of a bad beat. So this is, yeah, that was just a so enlightening 
comments. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like for most of my audience that's in the United States loves the National Football League. And you know that the best team in the NFL can lose to the worst team in the NFL on any given Sunday. And yeah. like as soon as you said that, it's like, wow. So an empire can just lay an egg <laughs> one day and then they're just toast. They have an off day and they're just done. Uh, that's that that is pretty brutal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, man. So been building your business. You're now taking some more time for your own self care, your own mental health, your own well being. One of the questions that I like to ask in these round twos is, um, I want you to imagine a, a greatest hits collection for the best stories that you've accumulated in your career through the world of cards. Um, tell me a story that's on your personal greatest hits album. Uh, when it comes to poker. Yeah. Poker. I think, I think we should probably focus on poker a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, I think it's quite, um, quite recent. And it's not a personal story. It's a story that I've heard from a client where it resonated so deeply with me that it, it really stuck with me for a while now. Um, a couple of months ago, I had a conversation about uh, with a client about uh, his story growing up, looking high, at high stakes poker, looking at all these great characters like Antonius and Dwan and Ivy and Far, and mostly looking at Dwan. And seeing this living legend, God, the presence, the power, the confidence, the termination. And he always had that as a desired identity in mind. When he started his career, every day he was reminded of, that's what I want to be. That's who I want to be. That's the kind of presence I want at the table. And he thought poker was the tool to get him there. And eventually actually got there. He went years after he went to Macau, he played with Ivy, he played with Duan, he played in the high stakes, nosebleed, crazy games. He's still playing these private games. And the main thing, biggest realization that he had throughout his career is that he said, I never felt like him in my career ever. I always had this extreme sense of self-doubt, insecurity. I don't feel determined at all. And even though I reached a similar level of success, I just don't feel like him at all. And that's where we together came to the conclusion that if that's the identity we desired and we have to work at it in that framework in personal development and that poker will never be a tool to help you achieve a desired identity, just help you achieve career and money, some financial personal freedom, but you won't be like anybody. And it's going to be a pretty harsh realization when you get there for like, wow, I thought I was going to be like this killer stare down guy and confident and strong like Ivy. I thought I'm going to get all the girls like Gus Hansen. Or, you know, I thought I'd be like a funny bully like Tony G, but I'm just still me. And I got a lot of money, but I kind of feel like the same little insecure kid when I started out. Yeah, we play poker for money and not identity, right? Yeah. And I think that's... Yeah, I mean, we have to imagine that Tom Dwan, for whatever reason, again, this life variance, had that identity going into poker. And that's one of the things that probably led him to achieving success at such a high level in such rapid fashion at such a young age was, and that I noticed this in private coaching, I noticed this in my community, that there are some people like skill level in poker is actually not the largest determiner of overall success. There are some people that just have such utter confidence in their own ability, regardless of their actual skill level, that they just make it. They just have success month after month after month after month because they will not be denied. And then there are other players who have such self-doubt in their own ability, despite the fact that they have an edge, that they struggle putting in volume, they struggle with self-doubt, they um, get very upset after losing sessions. And yeah, so ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, effectively what I'm talking about is just performance and mindset, right? And how at, at some point as it relates to your poker skill level, it doesn't, it's diminishing returns to raise your skill level 
you really need to focus on your performance, your self image, the way you think about the game so that you can be more resilient. And it turns into a game of volume at that point. Like you, your major goal is volume. Once you reach a certain skill level. Yes. Yes. Put in the work, put in the hours. And that that's, that's really what it comes down to most of right. And networking, of course, getting yourself in good games, right? and uh, making good financial decisions with your money. Confidence is a huge part of it, right? Just keeping going at it, keep going at it, keep going broke and just keep trying. Eventually, you're going to hit one good run. And right? then if you learn a little bit in that process, then most likely you're going to reach a level of success that 99% of the poker players will never achieve. And um, definitely, in my experience as well, the, the, the most successful guys have definitely done a ton of self-work. Right. And I'm talking about consistent, successful guys, not like the guys who had a crazy online God run, but these guys were still around after a decade or two decades. They've done a lot of self-work. I mean, if I compare it to I have chess players, clients, I have golf player clients, I mean, golf is pretty deep in mental game as well. But chess world, um, trading, crypto, a um, couple of other mental games, it, it's like those guys... And with all the respect, but those communities live in the stone age when it comes to mental game. Poker is extremely ahead of its time. These players, most of them, are very well versed in mental game. And I, I credit it to, you know, the guys who was early in the game, like Jared Tendler and Elliot Rowe, who came in early and educated everybody. But you also got to have a community that is receptive to it and says, yes, okay, teach us. Like this very famous chess quote, I think by Kasparov, Gary Kasparov, who said, I don't believe in psychology. I believe in good decisions. Like that's the guys, those guys are extremely rigid in their belief that just make good decisions. Who cares about your mental, emotional well-being, like or whatever, right? So um, I feel in poker, they're so incredibly developed in that area. And, and that makes it cool, but that also makes it quite challenging as, a, as an upcoming coach, uh, because you're going to get tested. They're really going to test your knowledge around mindset, mental game. They know, really aware of it all. And uh, I think in a way it's good, but in another way, it's also not that great for the game because you have this, this army, <laughs> this mob of mentally stable, fully performance optimized wizards <laughs> in tournaments, right? And that obviously is not good TV. That obviously not entertaining, right? You want the guys like in, in soccer uh, who, who bites a guy like Suarez you want the Ronaldo who look pretty and, and, and yells at the crowd and puts like five fingers up and, and taunts them. You want the guys, you know, to, to like Pepe to, to kick a guy in half. That's that's the guys you watch TV for, right? The controversy and the storylines. And I think that's maybe what's missing a little bit from poker these days that you that mentally there's been such a great space. Most of them, I would say, not maybe it's it seems like. Right. Let's keep it there. That mentally they're in such a great space and the performance is so optimized. They're so aware of what's optimal that it's, yeah, the entertainment factor is a little bit lacking in, in my experience compared to before. But I mean, I'm from the golden age you as well from high stakes poker and guys smoking cigarettes on the table and doing crazy stuff, you know, yelling and, and dressing up silly. But yeah, just I, I, and when you look at chess compared to that, then you still have those characters in chess who are just madmen, absolute madmen, crazy, right? Um, yeah, it has its pros and cons, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this segues nicely into the recent Helmuth tirade at the WSOP. Yeah. I think, you know, I read a an article or a study or something many years ago. I, I don't know where from, but basically it was talking about reality shows and how contestants are chosen for reality shows. And they choose the people who are a little bit unhinged, right? They choose the people that are like on the edge. They don't choose the people who are well put together because that's not going to create drama. It's not going to create good entertainment. It's not going to create good TV. And I, I think that that sort of overlaps with what you're saying about the poker world is like, yeah, I mean, we train ourselves to be emotionally strong, so we take a bad beat, we tap the table, and that's it. <laughs> There's no, you, you know what I mean? Or we win a massive tournament, and we tap the table and say nice hand, and that's it, right? So oh, it's very optimal for the mind. Yeah, 
<laughs> is it right. fun? <laughs> not really. <laughs> it, probably not fun viewing. It, it's good for the career. It's probably good for the day to day life. And I don't know if there is a way to bridge that gap, whether it is, you know, going into Helmuth, um, developing some kind of persona that is just for entertainment value. Although, I don't know. I'll ask your opinion on the Helmuth thing because I, I, I'm unsure about Helmuth's acting ability in that like is he that good to be able to act the way that he does in tournaments like i i don't know you you, you tell me what are your thoughts Ballman? well first off i mean i'd i'd pay to to have a session with helmet that that's for sure um <laughs> but well i think before we get into how i think it's important to note that in my perception helmet is the only lifeline that we have left to mainstream pop culture there is nobody in poker that has a mainstream line to right to the world of Kim Kardashian to Jay Z Kanye West to like that level of you know Barack Obama type bad Brad Pitt and we bullied all of these celebrities out of the game to be real about it right the celebrities came into the game and everybody said what does Kim Kardashian know about poker we bullied Dan Bilzerian out, out of the game we bullied all of these famous guys who sit at the table. And, and, and in my view back in the, I got very frustrated about that, especially against all the bad plans of the Bilzerian as well, little, just, but that's on, you know, little side note. Uh, I don't care if he's lying about how he's making his money or I don't care how it, how it looks when he talks to millions of people and Joe Rogan about, it's good for the game. People will watch a game with Bilzerian. I, 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 I will mean, give, is, I'll give Bilzerian that, that as far as awareness and all that, I, the thing about Bulzarian that drives me nuts is how how he treats females and just that whole side of him is like, ugh, it's just so scummy and awful. Completely agree. It's it's horrible and, and it's unforgivable, right? Totally agree. But the variety of characters, I think, is what's necessary to make a game attractive, especially a game that is not a sport. Right? It is not like soccer. It is not like football. It's not like tennis. It is not a mainstream accessible sport that you can beam on a big screen somewhere in the middle of a city and people will huddle up and watch it. Right? So if you deal with something like that, you're fully dependent on the characters and the quality of the characters. And we have to be a little bit forgiving when it comes to certain characters, especially Helmut, because it's actually the only reason why sometimes my wife talks about poker. Hey, you seen that crazy guy talk about you're going to burn the casino down? I just saw that shit on Facebook. What the hell? Like, wow, you heard about that? You heard about a RAS tournament? Like, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you watch the Kardashians on Netflix. You heard about a RAS tournament? That's nuts. So it's really our only lifeline left to mainstream popular culture. And... What do we do, Bauman? I mean, what's the what's the solution here, Coach? Do we? I'm honestly terrified when when Helmut ever retires. Like, who do we have that's going to pull in all of these things? Like, he played poker with Mr. Beast and all of these guys. He's constantly in the right seats with the right table in the right rooms. With he's just an incredible networker. He's really, really. I think he's really aware of that. That he can capture the attention of the right people, and that he's extremely likable because he's so polarizing right and that the people around him definitely see what he's doing they're aware of what he's doing they're smart right and he's smart of course um i think the average viewer could view him as a douchebag but if you're aware of what he's trying to do i think it's not all emotion i think it's not all entitledness i think it's also knowing that it draws attention and knowing what kind of spotlight is on him and that when that light hits him and he's at that final table, it's start scene. It's perform time, right? He's an actor. He goes and he grabs that moment because if he doesn't do it, who does? And That's the reality. Uh, well, luckily for him, he's the only he, he's the one, right? So like he, he has that opportunity um, over and over and over again. What about Negranu? You know, I think Negranu's place in poker is at least I, I probably bigger than Helmuth um, as it relates to mainstream popularity and stuff like that. Um, what are your thoughts on him? I'm, I'm not sure. I feel like, I feel like Helmuth is actually really pushing 
for that position. And he's actively trying to develop himself in that position. I'm not sure if um, Negron cares that much about that. And that's, of course, assumptions, wild assumptions. Uh, I, I feel like Helmut cares about that position and sees himself in that position much more than Negrano does. I feel like Negrano is really happy with his place in the poker world, with winning tournaments, doing his thing, uh, and doesn't chase that limelight as much as Helmut does. Uh, and I think you need a person like that, that loves the limelight, that loves the mainstream attention, that loves when Tony Robbins says you, you have a great book and puts a little signature in his book, and that loves the validation from those right? Famous people. And that's, that's what you need. You need a, pe- a person who actually enjoys being that person. It has thick skin, right? You know, we, you, you mentioned the word polarizing and the reality of a polarizing figure is that if you hate them, you still watch them because you hate them. And if you love them, you still, you watch them because you love them. And so like somebody that polarizes where people love or hate them, just means that more people watch them and more people pay attention and you have to be okay with you just have to have really thick skin as somebody that's you know in this spoker media world my skin is <laughs> nowhere near as thick as a phil helmuth because like if i acted like helmuth did on live tv like oh my God, I would have like an existential crisis and breakdown just in front of everyone, right? I, I'm not- well, Can you imagine how, th- this is why it works, right? This is why, let's compare it to Negrano, which I think would be, if we could vote, probably the vote would go, hey, let's make Negrano the spokesperson of, of poker because, hey, he would definitely fit that mold. He went a little bit crazy on YouTube live streams a couple months ago, right? We all seen the video. That just- and there's nothing to take away from the Grano and his achievement, but that didn't seem as authentic as Helmut doing it. When Helmut does it, I think the rage that ensues from people is because it seems so authentic, like he actually is that guy, like he means it. He actually means from the deepest part of his soul, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's so it's so it's so important for him to state that so it's so authentic to him and that's why i think we're all so upset compared to let's say the guy who said nine high like a boss and bluff the guy and you know bluff the girl right that that just felt like a little bit of an act and with helmet jesus feels like this is him and that's what frustrates people i think help has always been that way like he you know he's always been the way that he is today and negranu hasn't Historically, Negranu, forever, super nice guy, calm, chill, just even keel. And then for him to kind of go berserk, it was weird. It made me feel weird. I was like, this is inauthentic. It came off as such. I don't even, yeah, I have no idea. Like maybe he just hid that part of himself for many years. And it, and it is, I I have no earthly idea. Um, But yeah, for sure. Like when Helmut does it, it resonates. It's like, yeah, like you can. I think he's legitimately very angry in those moments. I, I think that he could turn it off. He just chooses not to, probably for all the reasons that we just talked about. Yeah, just lets it go because in reality, there hasn't really been any dire consequences. And and my argument would be, should there be, right? Should there be any rough consequences? You know, we have a lot of rules and soccer and football as well, who are rules that apply pretty much to everybody. But if you as a referee would apply that rule in that situation, you'd be kind of a douchebag, right? If a guy scores a goal, which is like the seventh goal of the game and the team is getting crushed and he takes off his shirt, you give him a yellow card. But if a guy scores in the last minute of the final of the World Cup and it's a one nil game and that means he won the World Cup and he takes off his shirt, you're not going to give him a yellow card. That's a douchebag move. So I think that forgiveness is actually really top class from WSOP. That leniency, the thing, this is a final table. This means a lot to this guy. Let's just, let's just let him have his moment. It'll be great for TV. Let's not punish it. Let's not, let's not dim that part of him. Let's not push it away because it's actually, it's beautiful. Like, this is what you want. You want a little bit of emotion. You want some engagement. And yes, I agree. It kind of comes off as unfair in a way. 
ultimately earned that spot, right? He's a special guy. He's a really special guy. And there's guys in every sport who get away with shit like that, right? Tyson got away with a lot of crazy stuff. And so many different athletes got away with a lot of stuff that other people, I mean, McGregor got away with a, with a lawsuit and potential jail time when he threw a trolley in a bus and almost killed some people. There's always athletes who get away with things if they pull in the numbers. Right? Yeah, I the one thing that I, I guess I will say for Helmut is I've never seen him make someone cry. Like, I've never seen him just terribly upset one of the people that he's playing against or somebody that's on the receiving end of his tirade. Nobody's ever been like, hey, this makes me feel really bad about myself as a human being. Uh, it's like, it, it's almost this like badge of honor getting yelled at by Phil Hellmuth, right? Like every, everybody is just it. kind oh, of, I love it. Yeah. everybody's laughing, right? Even the, even like Zeno who, you know, he, he tweeted about the situation, like only Phil Hellmuth can get everybody to care about a seven card, 10 K seven card stud event. You know, he was on the receiving end of the tirade right? and he didn't mind at all. So, I think there is that level of tact. And I, I think that over the course of Helmuth's poker career, yeah, li like you said, circum circumstances, the circumstances matter. And uh, yeah, to my knowledge, I don't know of anybody feeling bad. I mean, I guess somebody could send me an email about somebody just being emotionally distraught over being on the receiving end of a, a Helmuth tirade. But um yeah, I mean, there some, yeah, there are some definitely some um, some special circumstances for him specifically. Some some special treatment that he gets, and in my opinion, he deserved it. He deserved that spot, and he's really. I believe he's the last guy we got, but you know, at least one of the last guys we have that is keeping this game super relevant outside of the community because a lot of poker players have their heads in the community too much um, the vast majority of the world does not care about our game and that's a reality it's been better days right we've had better days but now if you look at it a big chunk of the world just doesn't really care that much you don't have the big headlines anymore at the news and poker is not being um uh, on tv here in holland for ages it's been a time where it was on prime time every single night, right? So it's it's definitely taken a couple of hits with Black Friday and all the crazy legislations. And now even poker stars got kicked out of Holland, you know? So uh, there's so many things going on now in the poker world that if we have a guy who can, you know, put us on the top of the headlines from time to time, put us, make us go viral on Facebook from time to time, man, thank you. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Really, I, I uh, thank you. So I know Matt Savage listens to this show and I think you know he's in charge of the tournament directors association and they've the WSOP has had missteps over the years you know there's the infamous f bomb rule where people were penalized for using the f bomb at the WSOP and it was enforced kind of arbitrarily by the dealers and whoever they just don't like they're going to enforce it against I think poker needs more gamesmanship I've always thought that like outlawing a player from turning over a card in a poker tournament to gauge a react. I mean, this is like gamesmanship. This is entertainment. This is yes, yes. emotional and captivating to the audience. Yes. Um, and yeah, like it can create an edge for experienced players over less experienced players. However, I think that we need to weigh that in consideration to the larger picture of will it help poker's growth? Will it make it more entertaining? Um, and, and that's something that really should be thought about. I, I've always found that aspect of poker just captivating of like, you've got a big decision to make on the river, you turn your hand face up and look at your opponent and try to get a reaction when they realize what it is they're trying to make you fold, right? Like that's just, that's entertaining to me personally. Um, mm -hmm. I am totally biased because I, I am a pro and I've played lots of live poker and there is an edge to be gained here. However, I think that overall it's good for the game. We need to think about more things like that that just make the game more compelling than, you know, like you said, the the people who are coming from full optimized state that have very minimal reaction one way or the other.
Yeah. And actually, in reality, that's not that's not that optimized. That's really that's the opposite of optimized. What they're trying or what they're attempting uh, is actually having an opposite effect. It's making the environment less entertaining and less fun for themselves and for the bad recreational players. So it's a lose lose situation because you're having less enjoyment from what's supposed to be your job and the players against you are also not enjoying it as much. So you're just bleeding this cow dry instead of being able to benefit from this cow from 50 more years, you're just killing it in a year or two, right? Uh, make the environment fun is a win-win for everybody, for yourself, right? You would like to enjoy your job, I guess, and for other people as well. And then these lifetime bans are pretty crazy as well, right? I mean, look at what you have to do in other sports to get banned lifetime. That is, you got to do a lot, right? You got to do a lot. You got to kill somebody, I think, right? You can, like, actually like, beat a person up on the field. Like, you can actually beat them up, and you'd get maybe a year or something, maybe two, whatever. But these lifetime bans are also quite intense. Who's I been, don't know. Am I, who's been banned lifetime? Yeah, there's a couple of guys who've been banned lifetime from casinos where the WSOP is. Really? And I, I don't know the details of what they exactly did, but I just feel like that helps with people staying in check and, you know, not going out of line in any way. Uh, I feel like that that intensity is in a casino environment, right? You, you're not, you, you kind of felt a little, you don't feel that freedom as you would have on a sports field or a, a different performance field where you are there to perform and whatever happens emotionally happens. Of course, there's a referee if there's somebody keeping things in check, but in a way, because poker is played in a casino environment with casino rules, I think that's, that's a tricky part of it, right? That you still, at the end of the day, have to abide to casino rules and there's other guests and people as well there, right? It's not a soccer field. You can't just, you know, you tackle somebody or, punch him in the face. So I, I do understand there's some rules to abide by, but I would, yeah, I would love to see loosen up a little bit. Exactly what you're saying. Um, everyone. <laughs> what would be your suggestion to the crushers on the circuit for making the game more fun as it relates to showing more personality, making it more entertaining? What would you suggest? Develop social skills, man. That's really all there is to it. I think when you don't express yourself in a way that is enjoyable for yourself and for your opponents, most likely there might be some blockage or some conflict there around not feeling safe enough to express yourself in that way. Or maybe you're that determined on squeezing out every inch of EV that you can get possible. Most of the time, in my opinion, though, and in my perception of what I've seen is that people just don't feel comfortable enough to open up like that in an environment where they're competing. And that requires some confidence, right? It requires some letting go. It requires getting over your fear of being rejected, uh, fear of being judged. Um, maybe people don't think you're funny or entertaining or don't want to talk to you. And there's all kinds of fears or risks that come with expressing yourself in that way, uh, taking charge of a table, right? Taking the lead. You, have, you, you know these plays, right? You and I have seen live games where this, this one guy the whole dynamic of the table just depends on this person. Lively, fun, giving drinks, uh, having a blast. Whether he's losing or winning, he's just a great energy and a great guy to have on your table. And uh, those people did not, well, sometimes, you know, they were more, uh, more uh, uh, easier for them to develop into that. But there's work involved into becoming that person. Right? There's a lot of work in... In, in developing yourself, your emotional intelligence, your social skills, uh, and that's practice. That's really just practice. Open up, communicate. Guy on your left, guy on your right, try it there, right? Open up a conversation with them. Talk to them. What's your job? What do you do? How long have you been playing poker? Just open up a little bit, right? And in that way, it's going to be a win-win. You'll get more information. You can crush them even harder, and you both might end up with a cool relationship together, right? Yeah, and... What are some like baby steps? Because, you know, we started this conversation out talking about variance, right? And at the poker table, I tend to be that person that talks to both players on my left, players on my right, um, you know, being a when I'm winning, 
not really talking very much about about the fact that I'm winning. Um, when I lose, you know, trying to be a gracious loser and sort of self deprecating. Like the last time I got absolutely drilled, uh, I just at, at the end I just kind of tapped the table and said something like "fuck this game" and like everybody laughed and then I, I wandered off into the casino. Right, a and the variance I'm talking about is. I don't know that I have worked on these things. This feels like a natural thing to me, whereas sure. with other people, it's probably not as natural. So what are steps that folks can take to sort of develop these social skills? Uh, it's, it's actually really simple. Uh, the basics of it is help people in whatever way possible. So it sounds counterintuitive because you would potentially make a player better. But if you have a person next to you who is possibly a recreational player, just reaching out and helping him by even showing his support to whatever bad beat he got or good decision that he made, commending him on that or bad decision that he made, giving your thoughts on that in a very empathetic and kind manner. That's already uh, a very nice way to connect with somebody. Just show that you're there for one individual. Don't engage in a group, that's scary, right? Just focus your energy on one individual and reach out in some helpful manner, right? Can also be, maybe this guy's quiet, he's not talking, he's, he's shy like you, right? Reach out to him and have a conversation. Yo, where are you from? What's your job? Not a person in the world would say fuck off. They're there at a poker table, they're there to have fun. Nobody in the world would ever tell you, go fuck yourself. They'll probably say, I'm from here, this is my job, what do you do, right? And now we have something going on, a little bit of an interesting dynamic, which is safe between you and him. Don't have to get the whole table involved, that's scary. Just one-on-one, -on -one. Um, because if you look at every single person there, most of them are like you. It's a rarity when you have a person who's comfortable enough to open up, make jokes, be a comedian, right? Those are always maybe one, maybe two at the table. So seven, eight other players are like you. They're there to connect, socialize, make friends, but they just never really feel comfortable enough to make that step, right? If they're not surrounded by maybe some two, three other friends, stable friends. If they're on their own, they're like you, right? So they're dying for somebody to reach out and say, what's your job? What do you do? How, how did you get here? Did you travel? Where do you sleep? Right. Those are just super simple steps, I think, and, and it's going to make your experience so much more fun. And especially if you look at how much value there is on a poker table of networking, of people with opportunities for you now and in the future, people are letting millions just lay on the table and walk out. Yeah, that's those are greatness bombs. And I've never really thought about it in that way, but. The people that you play poker against who are pros or recs, especially live poker, um, more applies to the recs. It's because they, they're they choosing to be there. They're choosing to be in the social environment. They're choosing to play poker at a table with eight other human beings, which means they're choosing to do something social, right? Um, yes. And there's typically a reason for that. Now, there are pros who choose to be there just because they want to make money. And if there's anybody at the table that is likely to be there and totally miserable, it is like a small winning pro <laughs> because they don't want to be there. They feel like they have to be there. And so they just have a bad attitude and they're not like open or engaging. But like the people that the, the, you know, wealthy businessmen, the wealthy success stories, the folks that show up to just engage with other human beings. They want that communication. They want that contact. And all you got to do is say, hey, man, what's up? What's your name? What do you do? What's up? There you go. And that's it. And then like the ice is broken. You don't even you don't have to give them poker feedback. I, I do say this, though, and I don't know, again, the variance of how I'm constructed as a human being, but Whenever anyone away from the table has asked my opinion about a spot or a hand in poker, I have always given my absolute opinion. You know, I, I just give them my opinion, what I think of it, whether it means that they feel like they played a hand poorly or whether it feels like it, you know, they, they play a hand well. Like there's a lot of, um, I think the worst thing you can do is to try to fake it and to try yes. to like blow smoke up people's ass because like, People are very highly aware when somebody's not being authentic, when somebody's just saying sort of like 
a robot what they think they're supposed to say. So yeah, I think that's another part of it. Just be authentic, be you, give your own opinion and realize too that like the people that say, oh, the training sites are killing poker. These people are killing poker by teaching people, by educating people, have not once in their lives ever tried to educate a human being in how to play poker. Because if mm -hmm. they did, they would realize that like most things are in one ear and out the other. It doesn't really matter. The actual actionable advice is irrelevant. It's how you deliver the advice and what your energy is in delivering it. Because like there, there's a, a, a massive canyon gap between knowing what you should do and actually doing what you should do in the moment. And yeah, I mean, if it were as easy as tell somebody to do something and then they just do it that way forever, well, poker would have been dead many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's a scarcity mindset, right? It's like saying that um, sports commentators are killing the sport, right? but that's just complete nonsense, right? It's actually helping grow every single area, right? Professionals, critics, commentators, coaches, all the people on the sidelines working behind the scenes in industries are the backbone of the industry, right? Are we keeping this industry alive, right? These people that come to you for poker coaching, uh, vast majority of them will never be greatest crushes on earth, right? These will be reasonable guys, maybe slightly losing, maybe slightly winning. That's not going to hurt your bottom line, trust me, right? Your work is not going to hurt anybody's professional's bottom line. It's actually even better because it's motivating to certain bad players, quote unquote, to keep going and to have faith and to see that sometime, someday I might make it. So just keep on putting this effort and keep on shoveling money to pros. Like <laughs> one day I'll learn and become a better player. Right. So if you don't have ambassadors like yourself in an industry, then what what kind of industry are we running? Right? If there's no money in the coaching or in the teaching or in the educational sector of that industry, it's not an industry. Right? Well, it means that there's a lack of aspirational poker players in the market. And if there's a lack of aspirational poker players in the market, then that means the game is dead. Dead? Yeah. I mean, it's really as simple as that. The decision to enter a hand is fundamental to poker strategy. Too tight, and they know what you have. Too loose, and you're easy to run over. The Free Flop Bootcamp from Chasing Poker Greatness is a comprehensive guide to locking down your preflop game and creating true range advantage. Eight days of guided training, over 60 optimal ranges, and access to a dedicated community of players that will push your preflop game from a place of weakness to your greatest strength. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. Available now. Before bootcamp, I had been playing for maybe 15 years, somewhat seriously, always trying to get better, jumping from learning program to different learning programs and training site to training site kind of feeling a little bit lost, not really knowing how to go about getting better. And Preflop Bootcamp just felt like a great starting point, a way for me to, to move from being a losing player to, to possibly a winning player. It felt like the right first step. Once you jumped in Bootcamp, what was your experience like? Well, first off, I realized that I'd been making a lot of mistakes prior to boot camp, kind of learning what rangers should look like and what hands should be played and what situations, you know, it was, it was exciting because I, I could see what other people had been doing to me, what kind of what I had been missing in my game. And then from there, just the whole camaraderie of everybody that's um, signed up working together, trying to achieve that goal, you know, that, that was fun. That's uh, pushing each other and really helping uh, one another, kind of feeling like you're a part of a team. It was, uh, it was a great experience. I, I enjoyed the process and I learned a lot. What was your experience like playing cards post boot camp? It's a totally different experience. You know, it put me in a position to be successful as opposed to always being behind the eight ball and, and playing catch up. 
Um, I really feel like it's it's the foundation of, of a solid poker game. And uh, since boot camp, I've been able to, to turn a profit and keep building on what I learned there. You know, being able to go back into the group and uh, re really work together even after boot camp was over, it's it's been awesome. What's your sample size of winning post boot camp? I think I have 70,000 hands played by now. You know, I'm a father and I have a job, so I'm not a, a professional player by any means. That's my sample size. Preflop Bootcamp is the flagship Chasing Poker Greatness training program. If you'd like to dramatically upgrade your preflop game, a new bootcamp launches on the last Saturday of every single month. And your link to join is chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp. One more time, that's chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp, all one word, or you can click through in the description box of this episode. So I, I have some prepared, prepared questions for you that, uh, I know oh. we're, we're an hour in here and we'll, we'll hit some lightning round questions. What would you say? What's the largest performance shift that you've seen in a client? Um, help the client quit poker and focus on golf. It was huge. And that was what had to happen. And that was wonderful and beautiful. And I'm extremely proud of that. Um, that was a person who was chasing his ego in the poker world, chasing the highs and the lows, uh, the variance and the flick of the parts, chips. But his true passion lied in golf. Um, and that's where we slowly shifted to. That's uh, where uh, he still is now. That was beautiful. Yeah, yeah there's um, an expression that I really love that always resonates with me. And it's, you know, be careful if be careful about climbing to the top of your ladder only to realize that you've been climbing the wrong ladder all these years, right? So be careful about what your aspirations are um, because if it, it's not very good when you achieve them and realize like, oh, this is not my thing. I, I've made a terrible mistake and wasted the last 10 or 15 years of my life. Absolutely. Yeah. And poker can be a deceiving son of a gun, man. You, you can, you know, have an incredible hot run and, and meet some great people along the way and play tournaments and travel. And you might feel on top of the world for a good year, right? Maybe even two and then inevitably when the grind kicks in and the repetition kicks in and your run dies out and you're only stuck with traveling, studying and losing hands, <laughs> it's all of a sudden not that romantic anymore, right? There's will be periods where it's just going to be very, very repetition. For well, life, right? I mean, that's, that's what poker is. That's the name of the game is repetition. And that reminds me of a, my my friend John, who co-hosts Tactical Tuesday with me, uh, trying to learn how to play PLO and like loved PLO. He would he like went to Vegas, was playing like the one two or one three PLO, and then the two five PLO, and just having a ball um, because his primary game is hold 'em, and it's what he's spent. You know, him and I have trained just massively over just the past year. Um, it, at six max Hold'em. And then once he learned how to play PLO well, he kind of lost the lust <laughs> because he was like, oh my God, like I don't get to do the stuff that was fun before um, because now I know that that was like torching money. So there is this sort of romanticism that comes with playing poker when you're a little bit ignorant of the overall strategy. And once you get educated, you're like, wow, this is not as romantic as I thought it was before. What do you say, what's the typical process for your high achieving performers that you coach? Um, depending on what phase they are in, um, if they're still in the building phase, right? If they're still getting there, um, then we try to define what is there. Right. How do we exactly define that point of there, what we're chasing for, right? Uh, what is that dot on the horizon? And it ha does it have uh, a, a pushing effect, a pulling effect? Right? What is happening towards that dot? Like, are we feeling rushed towards it? Are we inspired to go towards it? 
Uh, and what are the systems that we're building to get there? And are they going to be sustainable long term or are they just short term systems just to get the results that we need? And are we sacrificing and destroying too much towards whatever we want to achieve? So those are some topics that we um, usually will be around routines, habits, having a good day, right? Balanced day, uh, not chasing balance as much as we try to create harmony. Right, and that some things have priorities in life, and what does that's that mean? Fine. Chasing harmony instead of balance. Well, I believe that uh, chasing balance is one of the biggest sources of why we're burning out at such a high rate. That we want to put in the same amount of effort in every direction in our life, and that when we feel like we're putting in more effort in work, we're taking away effort from our family that frustrates us. But we try to put in the same amount of effort in our family as we do in work. And we try to play that min-maxing World of Warcraft MMO game, which is not realistic in life, right? You're going to have to choose priority sometimes in life, and you're going to have to aim for harmony in that priority, meaning creating an environment for yourself where the people around you are supportive of shifting your priority from time to time, right? Now I'm focusing on my family and work or the business understands that. And now I'm focusing on my work and my family, they understand that. So managing expectations, being realistic and making sure that the people around you and the work that you have is flexible enough to adjust to whatever shift you need to, uh, whatever gear you need to shift it. So it's not forcing yourself to be balanced, but it's accepting that sometimes we're just not balanced and that's fine. Yeah, I love that. Because that's the reality of life is that sometimes different things require more energy and effort on a regular basis. And we can't get away from that. We just have to accept that. And while at the same time also nurturing our closest relationships and making sure that everybody's in the loop and you're communicating what's going on so that they understand um, understand the situation. I, I think that's just absolutely necessary. And um, I... I also think that like that that pursuit of balance can also lead to lots of negative emotions inside yourself because you know that you should be doing something else and that that takes away from your presence in the moment with whatever you're trying to allocate more mental and emotional resources to and those people those human beings recognize that like like that's that's sort of the key is like human beings see through all the all the bullshit way much be way better than people give them credit for and so the best thing you can do is just to honor your own values honor um the things that are going on in your life yeah be honest absolutely be honest. and the second type i would say is people who uh you know the first phase of getting there uh have a set you know a specific set of challenges that we work through uh, and the second phase, I would call the people who are already there and looking to see what's beyond that. Is there anything beyond that? Uh, do I want the same thing to be beyond that, right? Am I a person who is chasing for like Helmut for that 20, 25, 30 bla bracelet? Or uh, do I get one bracelet and, and do I now start to doubt myself and doubt if this is actually what I want, right? And nothing wrong with both approaches, just that we need a different strategy moving forward. So there's, there's a lot of existentialism that we discuss in uh, people from a different phase of life, right? Who already got where they wanted to be and now have to define what is the next step. And what am I gonna take with me that worked from previous phase of my life into the new phase? And what are some things that I'm just gonna cut away? Yeah, this constant evaluation, I, I think is very important, the self evaluation, because things that worked a year ago may not work today. And we need to recognize that um, in real time before we spend another three years in futility. What would you say is your coaching superpower? Um, I'm quite provocative, and I like to make wild assumptions about people. That causes people sometimes to get very triggered, but it creates a conversation. And it helps people to get emotionally engaged into the session. Uh, I think that's something that I've learned. Give me from an give me an example, coach. Give me an example of your being a provocateur. Hmm. Uh, let me see if I can find something in my head that is not including on everybody's privacy. Well, for example, right there is a, a person, um, a client that I've coached around his thirties who had a pretty poor experience with relationships, right? Um, and, and you can assume that if you're 30, 
that most likely you could have one or two uh, bad, unlucky, right? Unlucky relationships that just gone sour for some reason. Um, but the way I perceived him to be and his attitude that he had and the way he described his uh, girlfriends at the time uh, caused me to feel like the problem might be more of a him problem. Um, so I just made uh, a wild assumption about him. Uh, and I said that uh, it seems like the women in your life were actually wonderful women and, and you were the douchebag. Um, that's just an assumption of based on the observation that I have from you and the information that you gave me. Right? And that's something that a person can agree with or disagree with, but at least now we have a conversation, right? We have something uh, between us that we can attack together. And, and I think that uh, loosens up people. Uh, it creates a very interesting dynamic. Uh, and in this area that like this new dynamic that we create together, it's different rules, right? The rules in conversations are slightly more flexible. Like it's allowed now to say, fuck you coach. This is completely allowed because I made a wild assumption. And then I'm allowed to be offended and say, oh, why are you telling me to fuck me? Well, what's, what's your problem? So we have a very interesting dynamic where the rules are a little bit more flexible and it's more forgiving. And we're gonna see a different side of each other, I think, because of that. And this is something that I learned mostly when I was a, a counselor on the street in uh, poverty areas in Holland. Started out the first three years of my career walking the city with police cops and just going around talking to little kids with guns and knives. And really the only way to reach them was by provocative coaching, right? And, and uh, that would be, for example, having a little kid with some guns in the street and walking up to the little kids and say, uh, you're going to have a use that gun or you just have it for like uh, accessories. I'm like, is it like, a, is it like a chain or are you going to shoot that thing? Right. Just to challenge them and to see if they're actually as tough as they claim to be. And oftentimes you see they're not. And then you have a cool uh, entrance point in a conversation. And sometimes you get shot. Sometimes you could get <laughs> shot. I, I once almost got shot and I almost got stabbed. Uh, but it's worth it really because um, afterwards we were still friends. And um, it creates a very interesting uh, respect for relationship between one another because they're used to people being afraid of them. It, so if you it, get into, uh, 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 show a different attitude towards them, you're already, you got their attention, right? And the same thing goes with highly successful clients. And most of my clients are when they get challenged and their decisions get questioned, it's something new for them most of the time. And I think there are two parts to this. Firstly, I think that like, you know, in the example that you gave, it's what you said cannot be something that they themselves have not thought about before. They've had to have that thought of like, wow, is it just me? You know, because I think that's very natural and human thought to have. And secondarily, it creates a space of trust because if you're if if you're able to call them a douchebag to their face, right? Well, that just means that they will trust the things that you say after that as well, because who is this person? Like, obviously, they're not afraid to say something negative, and so that just gives more weight to the positive things and the actionables and all of these things as well. And it really just ties back into what we were talking about before about being at the poker table and just being authentic, right? Just being honest, honest, yeah. honest with people and not just sort of telling people what they want to hear. Because quite frankly, if somebody who's a high achiever reached out to you for coaching, they don't want to be told exactly what they want to hear because they've probably been told that by many people leading up to this point. And clearly it has not served them well, else they wouldn't be there. Yes. Yeah, same example was with a high high level corporate uh, I've coach it's been since three months now coaching uh, big companies as well helping them with the same performance challenges in, in corporate environment and uh, one lady in a management position i told her straight up you're you're a scary lady like you're super dominant and aggressive and especially since the size you're a small lady you're a pretty lady but you have like you're a bulldog attitude and it's terrifying like you're actually terrifying and she's never been told that she's terrifying before she's probably been told she's beautiful all the time but never been told you're actually scaring me like what guy in his 30s is going to go to a girl at work and say you're you're kind of intimidating me. 
But that was the truth. At that time, that's what I felt. And I'm just being honest about it. Like you're really intimidating me with your attitude. And it's it's not a it's not a judgment. It's just me expressing my truth. And I think it always it's always good if you of course take an account that you're not intentionally trying to hurt anybody and not being, you know, a insensitive or a sociopath, but expressing your truth is usually a good thing to do. Well, people want to know what their blind spots are. And that's where the lowest hanging fruit are as it relates to coaches. It are the things they do that are on autopilot that they're just un completely and totally unaware of. That's why, you know, in my one-to-one -one private coaching sessions, I have my students record a plain explained video and tell me what their thought process is. I don't have them mark hands and bring the hands to me because what bears the most fruit are the decisions they make without even thinking about it that yes. are like, whoa, we got to think about this more. You've made a critical mistake here. And they would never bring that hand to me on their own because they don't think they're doing anything wrong, right? Right, they think it's standard, and it's just a disastrous mistake. And you, you'll be like, "What the hell is this?" Oh, I thought it was standard. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so a couple more. Have you ever strongly believed something about poker, only to change your mind later on? And if so, what led to that change? Yes, dealing with professional uh, poker player clients. I've started slowly to believe that when a professional says it's a fish, that they're actually horrendous, disgustingly bad players, like actually shoveling money over. Because that's how professionals casually describe certain players, right? He's horrible, terrible fish. And then I would ever see them play or I would sit on a table with them like this guy's solid like in my perception of course like this this is not this guy's not bleeding money right but the professional sometimes sees these small leaks and they know specifically how to exploit it very well and then assume this person is a complete idiot but the guy's actually pretty solid he's just unlucky that it has some very major leak against you that you have seen and you're aware of and now he's labeled as an idiot. And I went in with that perception of, okay, all of these guys at the high stakes are always playing with idiots because that's how they describe people at their table. And then I've had the opportunity over the last months to be at a lot of these games. I'm like, these guys are not, these are smart guys. They're playing pretty good. Like, okay, they get crushed, of course, but they're, they're, they're not bad players at all. And a lot of it, a lot of that, where it's like a high level player, labeling another high level player as a fish. It's like they just have a lot of overlap in their game. And then they also have blind spots that probably both neither one of them are aware of. And you see those blind spots, they stand out like a sore thumb and you're like, wow, that player is actually bad. And then that player at the same time is also thinking, wow, that player is an idiot because like we notice one another's blind spots without recognizing the commonalities. And another part of it too is like, if somebody gets the better of you, if somebody just holds something over on you a few times, then you're probably going to get emotionally triggered. Your emotions are going to flare up and then you need to make a story to make sense of that. And that story is going to be, well, they suck and they're just getting lucky um, because that's the easiest story for them to believe. It's the easiest way to reconcile the emotions that they experience. And, you know, don't get me wrong. There are fish that exist. There are players that play really, really badly, um, but you have to be very careful because even even as it relates to fish, like they make mistakes in different ways. And so like you have to look at the player that you're playing against and recognize like what they do well, what they don't do well, so that you can be more adaptive, you can be more flexible in the strategies that you deploy. And I just think that that makes you a better poker player over the long run. Absolutely agree. Yeah. And stop calling people fish, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so some of these incredible, smart, intelligent businessmen, they're just there to have fun. They're recreationals. I like that term much better than, than I guess so many people throw the word fish around. That's kind of insulting. Like these people are a lot of times much more richer than you, play with 100% of their own money, super successful in their field of whatever they're working at, probably more successful relatively than the pro, right? And if they would switch seats, then I would like to see a poker pro sit in the chair of a CEO of a big company one time, right? Let's see what happens then, right? So that's this, this I think, <laughs> is important, right? 
Bauman, we're so we're at this uncomfortable situation here. Like, so I have a course called Fish in a Barrel, um, and I actually <laughs> I talk about fish specifically, um, and I think. I guess I've gone through the whole stage of like not wanting to offend people by calling them a fish and calling them recreationals or amateurs or whatever the term or label is. And over time, I've just, I've just finally come to the conclusion that like the label of fish at least captures the profile that I'm talking about better than a rec or amateur, because I have amateur friends who are better poker players than me. Um, that just don't have get to spend a lot of time playing poker in rec. So like, I want to properly label an individual at, at the poker table, right? At the poker table specifically. And I that's just the label that is available. But I don't think it's like a judgment call on this hu- at person as a human being, because like you said, they are successful. Like we're all fish in lots of ways. We all started out poker as a fish. We're fish in relationships. We're fish... Um, in business, we're fish. Like we, we just have a low skill level in lots of areas in life, and these people just happen to have a low skill level in the area of poker, which to me is not really a judgment on their abilities as a human being. It just, quite frankly, means that they probably haven't invested a lot of time in honing and growing their poker skills, uh, and they I... probably just don't care that much about it either. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, um. All right, so what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Oh, um, and as you guys maybe have already seen, or as you maybe have seen, I, we've been hiring tons of people, uh, project managers, coaches. Uh, we're really ramping up and scaling up the company now because we started with corporate coaching and we um, implemented this high intelligence, high sensitivity, performance, um, mental gain, All of the experience that we built up in the last decade and with poker players uh, really gave us a huge edge when it comes to corporate performance because the corporates don't perceive it in that way. But in many cases now where we're going, where problems are becoming more and more abstract and more and more commercial companies are building the future like Tesla, but also other car companies who are trying to build uh, full autonomous driving or futuristic cities or going to space, right? There's so many complex abstract problems to solve that the world is going to be more and more designed for the creative, intelligent worker and less for the practical worker. So knowing that most likely in the future, we're going to see more and more of these people thrive and get into high positions. And at the same time, also not really be able to manage performance at that level. Um, because in those corporate environments and where I've been able to, you know, um, have meetings with, with companies at the level of uh, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Toyota, uh, those guys perform like top teams in the NFL or in, 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 in tennis or, in the, you know, like Real Madrid or Barcelona. Like these are top level, A level mental athletes who perform at the peak every single day where the stakes are tremendously high and the stress is constant. Uh, There is not periods of deadlines. There is always a deadline. And that requires a a very special approach to corporate performance, to your team members' performance, or else most likely you're just going to burn them out one by one and have a very short cycle of um, performance in, in in your team of maybe a year, six months, two years max. Uh, so make, to make that consistent and to have a long-term strategy for that, I think corporations have a lot to learn there and they can learn a lot from from the poker world as well. Yeah, it's these CEOs, these types, they're, they, they're leverage, right? They leverage lots of people and they need to leverage them appropriately and they need to have a good fundamental process of leveraging all these human beings so that their company can thrive moving forward and so that it's a a good work environment for everybody else and you know yeah you just have to understand kind of what's going on when you're at that level where yeah you're managing people who also leverage hundreds of people themselves And, and then yeah that when when you have when you're in control of that lever you have to be very careful, very conscious, and be able to perform at a high level because if you mess it up, then it has consequences throughout your entire organization. And that's just, yeah, a lot of pressure on those folks. Yeah. 
and not just the organization, right? People's lives. Right? Sure. People's yeah. Lives. Yeah. Their, their lives. Um, all right. Ripple. For sure. Coach, I think we, we've reached the end here and final question. You're hiring all these coaches. You're expanding. You are building your business. You're doing all the things. Uh, where can the chasing poker greatness listener find more about you on the world wide web? Coachbaman.com and Coach Bauman on every single social media, wherever you go. I'm Coach Bauman. I try to stay up to date with all of them channels, but I, I, to be honest, I hate social media. So if I engage with you on social media, um, feel very honored because I absolutely <laughs> hate it. And uh, if, if I ever are able to step in to the background and, and give my company to somebody and, and just be the, the, the fat CEO sitting on the, in the office, I will, but like snap call uh, instantly. I would, I would love to do that. But, you know, until then, I think a personal brand is important. So social media it is Coach Mama everywhere. Reach out to me or CoachMama.com. Fill in a form and we can have a chat together and see if you uh, are interested. It's getting busier and busier with all these new coaches and project managers. So if you ever want to have an opportunity to have some one-on-ones with me, I think now is the time. Um, it's not to brag or anything, but I think in a year or two, um, I don't know if that opportunity will still be there because I'm noticing that this managing company stuff is pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. I hope, I hope it's not there for you. And I also hope it's not there for me as well, because this is another one of my goals is to extract myself out of the private coaching arena and do more things behind the scenes. Um, because like you, social media is not my zone of genius, but it's a necessary thing when you're building a business. Um, hopefully one day, it won't be so necessary for me to be at the controls. Somebody else can somebody else can deal with it. Um, Coach, it's been great having you on as always. Love these conversations and we'll do it again in the near future. Talk about what's happened, you know, over the next 12 months, because I have a feeling that gonna gonna be some things that change. And that's that's exciting and stuff to look forward to. So take care, man. Appreciate it, Brad. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.